This is week eight for our study in uh, the series Swift Transitions, anticipating, welcoming, and celebrating the moves of God. And as we've shared in the last uh, seven weeks, now, now eight, it is our uh, aim, my intention for this series to help us to be thinking about how we can uh, navigate our present in light of where we believe uh, that God is going to be taking us individually and corporately as a church, as a community of faith. And we're, we're not always searching uh, what the end of the road might be. Sometimes we're not even sure what the next step might be. But we go forward, we proceed knowing that um, as we've been praying that God is in control and that as we've been sharing for the last few weeks, that part of the idea of God being in control is that God also makes opportunities available to us. And it is our task to make sure that as much as possible, that we are ready to open those doors when the opportunities present themselves. And so we've been discussing this notion that change happens, that change comes for everyone. And when the change event occurs, what happens from there going forward is the idea of transition. It is a process that occurs generally over time, and it requires those who are affected by the change event to make a determination as to what you, I, what we are going to do because this change event happened. There then is the beginning point of what we are calling swift transitions. And we want to be able to get to the point where spiritually, emotionally, financially, um, personally, even as it relates to our personal growth and development, where we can anticipate these changes are coming. And we know that there are life events that happen and we just know they're coming. Uh, well, we can welcome the notion of change and then we can celebrate what God will do with the people who have prepared themselves as best as we can to receive the change. And in that way, the change and the period of transition itself can become a blessing uh, to one and all. So that's that's the impetus behind our, our lesson today. Prayerfully, um, what has been shared has uh, hit home in a couple of respects. One is we're in now the uh, first week of the month of November. You know, we're looking around the corner at the year 2025. So we have one kind of change or transition coming. And with that, um, we are now on the back end of a presidential election. And so with that, we have perhaps a series of other kinds of changes that are afoot. And I think we're gonna recognize that because of these change events, whether it's the turning of the calendar or the presidential election, even the Senate and the House and all of that, um, we're processing and what we're going to do, how we're going to be, how might we react, what opportunities does God create for people who have prepared themselves for the eventuality of change? Okay. Um, and just as a quick note, if you're busy preparing yourself for the eventuality of change, that perhaps is one way that you can handle those change events that either catch you off guard or by surprise, or that you would rather not have to deal with. Um, and I say that having in mind uh, the presidential election that has just occurred without going too far down that road. Again, if we keep in mind the idea that it wasn't always going to be like it was, then we know we have to prepare ourselves for what's coming. OK. And also, if we keep in mind that even it, even as it's not going to be like it was, it also is not always going to be like we want it to be. Which means again, if you've been preparing yourself, if you are anticipating, welcoming, and learning to celebrate what God is doing, then you put yourself in position to uh, lift your head up high and let your soul be enlivened. And let the Holy Spirit of God en en enrich your experience even though it didn't turn out like you wanted it to. All right, so uh, that, that's my quick spiel on that for now. Uh, I may or may not say more uh, on Sunday. We'll see. Uh, but you child of God, you're in God's capable hands. So that's that's the word of God 
for us today. All right. Um, those of you who are joining us on YouTube, um, after uh, watching this recording or what have you, again, as we always have it, you can go to the church website to download the uh, handout that we are working through together. That website address is wordforlifechurch.org. When you get there, look for the Bible study resources. It'll be right there on that page. You can download right from the website and follow along with us um, even after the fact. So. Thank you for joining us uh, and watching the recording and sharing it with your family and friends as well. We praise God for you. All right. Last week, uh, we talked about succession planning. I told you last week, that's kind of part one where we discussed primarily the transition of power, looking essentially at the end of a particular season of life, uh, end of a season of life. So, we uh, lifted up the example of the prophet Elijah. So even though it was at the end of his life and he could have been a central figure for this week, what we recognize when we consider the life of the prophet Elijah is that he was also not only coming to the end of life, but he was also coming to an end of his season of, prof of prophecy. And God prepared the prophet Elisha to stand in his place and become the one of the foremost prophets of that day. And we saw there what it looked like to be in the midst of and to experience what I call the transition of power, but was essentially the end of a particular season of life. This week, again, we're going to carry forward this idea of succession planning as we look at the transition of presence. Transition of presence. So where last week the transition of power referred to the end of a particular season, this week the transition of presence refers to the end of life. The end of life. It's a conversation generally, I think, that goes un, uh, unhad or uh, it goes unspoken uh, in a lot of circles, whether it be in individual families, uh, churches, uh, I think, Corporate America sometimes has it right. They even have what's called key man insurance. And so they have that kind of the policy in place. Some churches have it as well. Um, and you may kind of think about end of life planning along those lines. What kind of insurance do we have in place? Are our documents in order? And all of that's right. And, and we praise God uh, for those of you who have already taken those steps. Uh, but we also praise God that we have we have opportunity if we have not taken these steps to begin thinking now about the eventuality of this change because we know it's coming for everybody. This change is one that's unavoidable. We know it's coming. The question is, how do we honor God in light of its eventuality? Okay, we'll see that today as we discuss together the transition of presence, end of life planning, end of life planning. So on the handout, you'll see at the top of the page there, uh, I start with Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse two, chapter three, verse two, really, really short verse um, in the Bible. Um, I don't know if anybody has that at your ready and you might be able to share it with the rest of us. If not, I can go ahead if, if you're not there yet. All right, let me just let me just go right on ahead. Are you you have it? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Ephesians three and two. Ecclesiastes. Is, Ecclesiastes. I, I'm sorry. Ecclesiastes three and two, and yes. this is the New King James version. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. All right. Thank you especially that first part of the text, but also in an agricultural sense, that second part as well. This verse teaches the certainty of one's span of life. By that, I mean to say not that we will live for a determined, mm -hmm. defined period of time. Yeah. So we may not know the day, as Jesus says, uh, I'm paraphrasing, I'm lifting his words from its meaning. We don't know the day, Amen. nor do we know the hour. Mm -hmm. uh, not the Son of Man's appearing. We don't know when we're going to check up out of here. Okay? But 
So that's not that's not the concern of that verse. But we do have a definite appointment with the end. We don't know when it's coming, but we know it's coming. And instead of this being a morbid conversation that we have to be afraid of or that we should avoid, I think it's right and it's helpful to look at this notion of the end of life through spiritual lenses as well as some extremely practical, uh, doable, can we get this done today lens, all right? So some of what we're going to share will be that type where we can get this done today if we really want to. Uh, some will be we can at least put the, the wheels in motion and, and get it done soon. And some of this will be let's make sure that we at least have our minds right and we're mentally prepared for what's coming down the road. All right. So um, what's required here as we consider this awareness of, of the certainty of death. What's required then is an awareness that this certainty should encourage us to prepare for it as much as we can. Okay? We know it's coming. The only question now is what are we going to do about it? Are we going to wait and be caught off guard when it comes? Or since we know it's coming, Will we do everything we can now to make sure, as we said before, that we are prepared to open the door when God gives the opportunity to do so? All right. If we prepare for it in advance, I think this indicates that one is able to anticipate the eventuality of this time of life. Not only anticipate it, but also I think this empowers uh, the person who's anticipating to welcome the end with expectation. And I think this is helpful as we approach the end of our lives, that we can get to the end. You may not have to smile your way home to glory, but you can at least get there with an expectation about what's to come instead of having to worry about what you are leaving behind. I think with adequate planning, uh, a person might even learn to celebrate as victory because death will not have won over you in any facet. Now, often we limit this notion of victory over death to the idea of sin and, and Christ forgiving our sin. And then we have uh, life eternal with Christ in heaven where there we sing and shout our troubles over and there'll be no more tears and no more heartache, no more wars. And there's sunshine all day long and there's howdy, howdy and never goodbye, right? And that's all great. And I'm looking forward to that day. I, I, I am. Uh, and I think if we can if we can hold that fast, that's one way that we can uh, really get to the end of life, welcome it, and then celebrate it even while we yet live. But I think there's something else here. I think the other part is, if, so we got the spiritual part, but now the, the practical piece is, what have we done to prepare not only ourselves, but our loved ones? for the time when we are no longer here, when our presence is no longer here. So what, as it relates to this transition of presence and the notion of succession planning, because this is caught up in that too, what have we done for the eventuality that this is going to happen? Okay, that's the essence of our time today. So if you if you kind of got that picture, you'll have a sense of what the rest of our time um, looks like, and then we'll we'll share together as we go. Before we do, though, are there any questions, comments, or concerns at this point? Perhaps something that I've shared already today, maybe something from last week that you need me to reiterate or say more about. If so, feel free to unmute or type it in the chat, and we can 
take it up, and then we'll move on. All right. Hearing and seeing none. I see a bunch of thumbs up. That's wonderful. I see the Murphys have found a new uh, widget to play with on Zoom. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> All right. All right. What is end of life planning? What is end of life planning? Again, for those of you who are with us on Zoom now, um, I put in the chat, there's a file there. It's called Swift Transitions End of Life Planning Checklist. You can open that up. For others, if you're catching us, especially after the fact, uh, please accept my apology because it's not my um, my work. It's the work of um, another uh, organization called Free Will. I can point you to it. Just type in your search engine, Free Will, and then search for a Free Will succession, or no, no I'm sorry, Free Will end of life checklist free will, that's one word, and then end of life checklist. If you put that in your search engine, um, you should be able to get to the PDF that has, uh, I believe it's 12 items on the checklist. And I'm asking those of you on Zoom to just pull that up. You'll see that as we talk about this part now. Okay. All right. So what is end of life planning? End of life planning is the process of making decisions and preparing for the time of a person's death. Making decisions and preparing for the time of a person's death, whether that time is imminent, meaning it's coming pretty soon. The doctors have already said you've got X number of days, weeks or months to live or it's far off, meaning we believe we're in pretty good health. We are in good, decent shape, relatively young or our family generally lives long. We have a long history of persons that live well into their 90s and what have you. And we, we feel pretty good now. So it doesn't matter whether whether the doctors are ready to call the family in today or whether you believe God is going to not call your name for some time. The idea of planning for this eventuality is called the end of life planning. OK, and it ensures that a person's desires are communicated and respected. And it involves both practical and legal considerations. All right, why is this important? First of all, because if you have accumulated uh, any amount of goods, resources, money, artwork, uh, investments, um, books, artifacts, you had a coin collection, a baseball card collection, you have important documents, uh, to plan what happens with these things gives you the power to prepare. It gives you the power to have say as to what you would like to have done with these items that are in your possession. We're going to talk about what this looks like in a moment as it relates to stewardship. But the idea here is that you don't want other people who don't either know you well or know you at all to make this decision for you. You don't want to leave up to people what happens with you, and you don't want to leave up to other people what happens to your stuff. So it's important that you undertake this, uh, that we undertake this uh, gift, I would say, of end of life planning. So I think this, this type of planning um, can be considered a type of succession planning because it accounts for the eventuality of our departure. So like succession planning, succession planning is intended to help organizations, and I, I extended this last week uh, to churches and families as well, to also be concerned about the eventuality of the departure of either the leader or the transitioning of that organization and family. So succession planning impacts organizations, churches, communities, families, um, and end of life planning can touch each of these each of these as well. Um, as I mentioned before, the idea of end of life planning is at the same time and sometimes in different ways, practical and legal 
but it is also emotional and it is spiritual. And we're going to talk about some of these right now. On the handout that you have, the Swift Transitions End of Life Planning Checklist, you have there uh, a few items that uh, free will would like for people to consider as it relates to the end of life checklist. There's 12 documents first. Um, the first group of them is listed under what is called your estate plan. So your estate plan, um, there's listed there your last will and testament. The last will and testament, there is a revocable living trust. And I'm not gonna name those items that are listed under each one. Um, do know that there are a number of ways to get at what you want to have happen with either you or your belongings, your, your resources. These documents are intended to help uh, to itemize those desires. After the revocable living trust is the beneficiary designation. So you have life insurance, you have 401k, retirement plans or what have you, um, and all the rest. There's a durable financial power of attorney. The power of attorney, you might hear that and associate that almost immediately with health concerns. This says we also need to have one for financial concerns. Sometimes it may not be the same person. Okay. Um, there's a pet trust. What happens to your pet after you are gone? All right, so that's, that's under estate uh, planning or estate care. This is uh, listed now under advanced care plan. And here's where you have the durable medical power of attorney. There's also here a living will. There's life insurance. There's a do not resuscitate um, form. And other documents like end of life housing arrangements. All right, um, housing arrangements. Uh, where what this means is when you get of a certain age and you're maybe not able to handle living by yourself and you need care, well, where do you want to go? Right. This is that level of planning. Where do you want to go? Who who would you like to have stay with you if possible? Right. These ideas need to be shared with persons who are going to make decisions for you, because while you are able to make the decisions, it's better that you do it. So you're in a place that you can believe is most comfortable for you um, and not most convenient for somebody else, if at all possible. Right. Uh, digital assets. Now, you know, we have things like cryptocurrency uh, and other uh, digital wallets that are out there. We have passwords um, that, you know, unlock the doors to a number of things, bank accounts, um, email, for example, digital assets. You know, so it's listing these things out so that your family and, and executor or whoever can get to the things that you have listed. And then finally, uh, there's funeral instructions, right? Everything from the burial to cremation type of service you want. Um, if you have a charity in mind that you want to have uh, receive uh, certain assets, whether it be mon monetary or otherwise, um, do you want to write out your own obituary? You want to write your own program for the service itself, right? So all of these things can be listed in the funeral instructions, okay? So again, extremely practical. Hope you see that. This is the reason why uh, it's necessary to have that level of planning. Because again, you have these resources or assets at in your control or at your hands, and it's necessary for you to uh, indicate how you want these assets to be distributed or used when your season of life has come to an end. All right. Extremely practical. But I think we can also see, appreciate here that this is also can be a very emotional process, right? After you've lived how you've lived, you've fought and scratched perhaps in some ways, you've inherited some other things that have significance and meaning to you and your family. And, and now you have to plan for the time where you're no longer going to be here, right? This is coming for everybody. So what, how do you handle this? You know, what, what do you do with this time? Well, emotionally, there's, and it's not on your checklist, but I think 
these kind of conversations need to need to happen as well. One, you can praise God that you have a pastor who can help you navigate perhaps the 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 road that is yours to travel. Right? Uh, I don't pretend that as your pastor I'm going to have all the answers. I can be there to hold your hand though. Right? It's a, it's an extremely emotional period of time for a lot of folks. Um, and you know we can have conversations. You got a, a conversation partner. You got a listening partner. And you certainly have a prayer partner, right? Now, of course, you don't have to come to me with all of this. If you you already have friends and family, loved ones who come this way um, before in terms of planning and can maybe help you to navigate from an emotional standpoint. Maybe it's just as much as hey, just how about we just today let's focus on the will and leave everything else for tomorrow, <laughs> right? It, maybe it's okay, you know, let's let's think a little bit more about how you want to divide your resources or where you want to live. And it can help with the research and all of that, right? It's, it's extremely emotional. You don't have to take all of it on yourself. This is the blessing and benefit of community. And not only your pastor, not only your friends and prayer partners, but maybe it's a good time for you to see a professional counselor with whom you can talk out what the end of life means and how to process this for you, okay? There's nothing wrong with a therapist. Take Jesus with you. You'll be all right. It can be extremely emotional and it, can, it's, it should be very practical, right? Um, and it's also very spiritual. particularly for the Christian. Um, end of life planning signifies the person's acceptance that this transition, just like all of change, the idea of change itself, that this transition is coming and it has your name on it. And I also think that planning for this eventuality helps those that we leave behind to come to terms with our transition. So note here that it's not just your mental well-being and spiritual good that's at stake. It's not just your emotions that need to be processed. It is those who love you, those who have care and concern for you. If you can handle your affairs, that may give them a sense of peace and comfort and be able to better receive the grace of God when it comes time for you to say goodbye. Why? Because they know that you're on top of it. They know that you have done everything you could to faithfully handle your end of the bargain. One, because you know what you want, but the other part is so that they don't have to handle that burden as well. It's already enough for loved ones who are saying goodbye to have to process what that means for them, let alone then to have to turn around and at the same time handle your stuff. Okay, so it helps us, but it also helps those we leave behind to come to terms with our transition as well. All right, so as I mentioned, from a practical standpoint, Planning in this way relieves the burden of trying to figure it out. And it also leaves space to locate God. Who needs to locate God? You and them need to locate God in this transition. I pray that you, you know what I'm driving at when I say this here. Right? Because the question is always, always going to come. Well, God, why them? Or why me? And why now? God, what are you doing? What are we up to? What are we supposed to do? Right? This planning can help you and loved ones locate God in all of this. And maybe it's 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 to say, listen, if you're talking to a child, and in my case, maybe a younger child, a teenager, listen, you know, we've been we've been talking about Jesus. And we know you know the Lord. And at some at some point, we're going to go to be with him forever. We won't be here anymore. 
And this is a difficult pill to swallow sometimes for children. But they they need to know mom and dad have taken care of the things that we could take care of. Why? Because we love them, yes. But two, because we're, we're going home. We're, we're, we're trying to get home. And on our way home, we got to do the best we can to represent Christ. And what does that look like? For me, it looks like Jesus, who didn't leave his disciples without a comforter. To me, it looks like Jesus, who didn't leave his disciples without a plan of action and gave them purpose for living. This is what it looks like, the process with your loved ones to help them to figure it out, at least their part of it, after you are no longer here. Because then when you're no longer here, now they can just say, well, you know, we had these conversations. We're prepared for this. Will there be tears? Probably. Will there be some sleepless nights? Probably. Right? Will there be some lonely moments and seasons? Maybe. But we've talked about this. And the same Jesus that my parents and their parents before them and their parents, that, this same Jesus is with us now. And if they could celebrate going to be with him, surely we can celebrate living with him. Right. I hope you see what this what this can mean, not just for you, but also for your loved ones. Right. Um, a few other re uh, reasons why end of life planning is important. I've listed a few of these on the handout. They're toward the uh, just under halfway of page one. First of all, it involves the stewardship of God's resources. And there's some, some scriptures listed there. I'll just lift up a couple of them. Uh, Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. End of life planning is, is a demonstration of stewardship. It's an example that we are being faithful stewards. Uh, continuity of ministry. It's important there, too, continuity of ministry, and especially as we look at it through uh, a church perspective, as it relates to our church. How, how do we can carry on? Well, I told you before, Jesus didn't leave his disciples without a plan and purpose. So you have Matthew 28, 18 to, through 20. That's the Great Commission. Of course, you, you may be familiar with that. This also has financial implications, does it not? Here's an area we, we don't often have these conversations in, in a number of church contexts. Uh, so maybe I'll just raise it now. In your will, uh, have you left any money to the church that you have been faithfully financially supporting while you've lived? Do your children and your executor, whoever that is, do they know that part of your desire is just as you were supporting your congregation while you lived, you also want to support your congregation after you are gone. There's financial implications here. Not just for the carrying out of ministry as it relates to purpose, but also that, you know, we can keep going uh, here as well. This is part of the, the trust uh, documents that you uh, may have experience with already, but it's also uh, part of the will. You can you can designate amounts or causes or purposes just like you would to any other charity. Um, and again, not often a conversation that we have in our church context, but I think it's one that's needed and necessary. OK, so there's stewardship of God's resources. There's continuity of ministry. There's also leadership development that's involved here. We talked last week a little bit about Moses. And Joshua from Numbers and Deuteronomy and how God was transitioning Moses off the scene and transitioning Moses or transitioning Joshua rather on to the scene as the leader of the children of Israel, that congregation, as they journeyed through the wilderness and in through and through the promised land. And as I'm looking at my handout here, um, I see that the verses there got jumbled up. I messed that up. Numbers, uh, Numbers 27. 18 through 22. Uh, you can take the three off, I believe. 18 through 22. All right. Thank you all for not making fun of me about that. Okay. So we have, again, so why end of life planning is important. Stewardship of God's resources. Continuity of ministry. 
Uh, three, leadership development. And then fourth, as far as I have it here, that we can empower future generations and encourage stability. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 says that God is a God not of disorder, but of peace. So we can encourage stability even as we empower future generations to pick up the mantle and carry it forward in the ways that can best serve and suit them. Question that I have there perhaps for our reflection is how are these reflected in our way of attending to the mission and ministries of our church? And you might be wondering, well, how did you get from personal consideration as it relates to succession planning and transition of presence from personal perspective over to a church perspective. Like, how do you make that leap? <laughs> well, I'm glad that you asked the question. I think our responsibility as faithful disciples of Christ is to always be concerned about the church of our Christ. We should have it in heart. We should have it in mind. That as we are dealing with various transitions in life, it could be a geographic relocation. It, you know, it could be um, health concerns. It, it could be um, going off to school and just maybe don't have the time concerns. And certainly as it relates here to the end of life and planning, Part of our concern should be that the mission and the ministries of our church can continue on. And now while I'm talking about this from the perspective of membership, now we also need to talk about this from the perspective of the, of the one who is charged with leadership, that being the pastor. Biggest question here is, do we have a succession plan in church or in place rather? When is my time to go? Well, I'm happy to report there is something of a plan. It's listed in our church. Uh, um, I believe it's in the Constitution. In the bylaws, there's a portion there listed as well. Um, perhaps we need to revisit it to see what it says. But perhaps we also need to revisit it because, you know, times have changed since it was written. And maybe we just need to brush it up a little bit. Not that I'm going anywhere, at least I don't think I am, going anywhere anytime soon. But it would be helpful, wouldn't it, to know that whenever it's time, whether you think it's time for me to go or whether I think it's time for me to go, <laughs> it would be helpful that we have something in place that we have looked at and said, okay, based on our prayer and discernment about who we are as a people, where we believe God is taking us, this is how we've mapped out uh, what is going to happen when the eventuality occurs, because it's going to happen. At some point, either one of us is going to decide it's time to go. If not, the Lord will call on my name and just take me up out of here. That time is coming. I, again, it may not be tomorrow. It may not be next week. It may not be next year. Right? But I would be something less than um, my best as your pastor if I didn't make sure that you were prepared to continue forward with the mission and ministry of this church. So that's that's my commitment to you. Okay. So we'll we'll work together through that. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? Comments, concerns? What are you thinking? You all had me talking for a long time here. Well, one uh one thing I would say that I think is very important. And that is, uh, no one wants to uh, think about going to glory, go to heaven, whatever. They don't want to do this planning that they're doing right now, as you just uh, mentioned to us. But I think it's very important to say, while you got your right mind and everything, do these things. Fill out these papers and things that you need to do while you are, uh, got your right mind. Don't wait until you can't think and somebody else has to think for you. So true. So true. Thank you, Degakins. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
So true. And you know, things can happen in the in the in the twinkling of an eye. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. So why you why you why you have your faculties about you? Might as well. Oh, also, Pastor, if we don't do these things now, the state will take over. If you don't have your will, they'll just walk in and take everything that you have, and your family will be left without nothing. Very true possibility. Right. <laughs> yep. And so that that's certainly a practicality, but now it's also from a spiritual perspective. Let's look at that what you just shared, uh, Dick Inez. Let's, as people of God, uh, we believe in some ways. At least maybe we should not. I shouldn't say that with such certainty. I think we should believe. Um, theologically or think theologically at least about various aspects of what it is to be a believer and you know can we trust God do we trust God with with not only the resources that we have but the resources that we're going to leave behind right a sign of trust is to be prayerful about what we've been granted and then also to be diligent about what we do with what has been granted to us. Mm -hmm. yes. um, we didn't we didn't read over this, but Matthew twenty five, verse fourteen through thirty, that's uh, under point one, a stewardship of God's resources, tells a story about the, the parable of the talents. Right? What do you do with these talents? And I think one thing we need to appreciate and, and add to that conversation is what do you do with the talents as it pertains to the end of your life? Did you bury them and let the state dig them up? Or did you faithfully distribute them in a way that honors the God who blessed you to have them in the first place? Maybe that's another part of that conversation that, that we can have. Thanks for mentioning that. Well, Pastor, I do know from my daughter's death that the state will come in and take everything except for what she had put on a paper to give to her sister and to us. Everything else they took. This is why these the checklist is is critical. It's absolutely critical. Okay. All right. Um, you can you can have conversations with uh, your banker at the bank branch. If you have a certified financial planner, they can help you with it. Um, there are attorneys that can handle certain aspects of of these uh, plans and what have you. Um, any number of people, any number of organizations. It just takes a little bit of time to find the one that, that you are most comfortable with and then just work through the process so that the end of life doesn't sneak up on you and catch you unprepared. All right, that's the aim. So um, I asked the reflective question there. We Again, that, so that's for you to just be prayerful about as ministry leaders, I also want to make sure that I say this, that part of our way to ensure that we have uh, adequately engaged in succession planning is to make sure that there's somebody there in the ministry who knows at least something of, of what we know and knows how to continue the work of ministry. Okay, Not only is this leadership development, but this is also empowering future generations, perhaps, it's certainly encouraging the stability of the ministry and the resources that God has granted to our church as a church family. So um, I want to encourage us, especially at this time of year, as we're looking at year 2025 and budgeting and planning for it. This is also part of that conversation that is helpful for us as we move into 2025. Who are we raising up? How are we ensuring that what we know and what we do can be carried forward. Okay. All right. Now, finally, on end of page one, that 
bolded question there. How can end of life planning benefit you and your loved ones? Um, we shared a bit here in the first about 45 minutes of our time. Maybe you already have something in mind and you just want to take that down as notes uh, are concerned. Um, I think it's helpful to identify the benefit because once you see the benefits spelled out, that might encourage you to take care of those areas that are still um, open for discussion that you have not yet taken care of. All right. So identify those. And I do believe that you'll be able to be in a position to take the care, take advantage of the opportunities that God prepares for us. All right. Let's go on the back of page. Uh, just flip over the handout on page two. You'll see there. Uh, we're going to be spending the rest of our time today in Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter four, to be precise, verses one through eight, as we look at planning for the end of your life, planning for the end of your life. And as we go, I'm going to ask uh, someone to prepare to read that for us. So you grab your Bibles if you don't have them already. And uh, go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. But as we go, I want you to note how the Apostle Paul anticipates, welcomes, and celebrates the end of his life. As this text shows us that sometimes transition means planning for the end of our own lives. So this is the transition of presence. He knows his time is coming to an end. He has got his young mentor or mentee, rather, his apprentice in ministry, Timothy. As I mentioned last week, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy are essentially his instructions for carrying out the ministry. And here in verse or chapter four, as this letter is drawn to a close, I believe we have something here that speaks to this idea of end of life planning. Can we have somebody to read for us uh, there, those, those eight verses? I can read, Pastor. Nobody else wants to read. Oops. Can you hear me? Yes, we're good. You may proceed. This is the New King James Version. Second Timothy chapter 4. I charge you, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and at his and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Succession planning, planning for the end of your life. How does Paul see this? I think there's a couple of uh, points or cues that he drops for us here. And again, if you have questions or comments along the way, Please feel free to uh, share them as we go. First of all, I think there's something here about this idea of relationships that come into play when we consider succession planning. Relationships. How do I see that? First, Paul has great concern for, great care for, his relationship with God through Jesus. This drives Paul's ministry this is what we have now come to identify as being extremely Pauline. In other words, this is his character. 
it's very much like Paul to be concerned about his relationship with God because he knows, believes, is convinced that God has called him to a work of ministry. And he believes that God is on the end waiting to receive Paul home when that time comes. So he says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, these this means, this signifies that God and Jesus are Paul's witnesses to what he's about to say to his mentee, his apprentice in ministry by the name of Timothy. His relationship with God through Jesus drives this entire uh, discourse here. And his relationship with Timothy is of utmost concern for Paul. As you read through, especially these eight verses, and you can even go back to uh, first, first Timothy chapter three and verse 10 and carry that forward. But particularly, I think what you'll find is that Paul holds this relationship to be of extreme value and importance. And he will not leave it to chance that Timothy will be prepared for the work of ministry. And even if Timothy can get himself there, Paul views it as a necessity to at least give him a hand up. Right. Timothy won't go to figure this out by himself. Paul won't let him. His relationship is too valuable. He knows that Timothy is going to have a road to travel and his relationship with Timothy spurs him on in this way. This is what drives him to outline this plan. And it's careful to note here, this plan has great concern for Timothy, but Paul sees this as his succession plan. It includes his beloved Timothy. I think the next part kind of flows from there. So there's a relationship with God through Jesus. There's a relationship with Timothy, but there's also how Paul sees himself. Paul sees himself as one who is able to give such a charge because he himself has received such a charge. Paul views himself as one in a position of authority who can be heard. Paul sees himself as one who has devoted his own life to ministry and to this particular mission. And so there's a certain gravitas behind that. There's a certain weight that this carries. He sees himself in that way. And I just, as I was thinking through this and praying about this part of the text, at least, verse uh, chapter four, I just began to wonder, as it relates to succession planning, what, how often do we take these kind of relationships to heart? How, how do we locate God when we start talking about succession planning? Paul does it. He, he says, let's let's bring God and Jesus in on this. They're going to be our witnesses. This is, this is important for Paul to have them there to give the stamp of approval, if you will. Right. Um, so as we are thinking through our own end of life plans, have we considered that God and the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who's the judge, uh, will be witnesses to what we are leaving behind. Or, and they are also witnesses to what we fail to account for. Okay. This, is, this, this raises the stakes theologically because now Paul has an under, a view that suggests that God is concerned about his succession plan. God is concerned about what Paul will leave behind. God is concerned about the charge that he's going to give to Timothy. I think God is also concerned then about those matters that you and I hold dear that we want to pass down to those who come behind us. So relationships have a lot to do with this. 
But, but now Paul is also able to anticipate now that Timothy's journey will be exclusively Timothy's journey. Okay. It might rhyme and have echoes of the journey that Paul took, but this won't be Paul's journey. This will be Timothy's. Timothy may travel to some of the lands that Paul traveled to, but Paul won't be the one making the journey next time. It will be Timothy. Some of the people that he may encounter may have gotten to know Paul fairly well. But when they look up next time, it won't be Paul that they see. It will be Timothy. Paul is about to exit stage left or stage right, wherever he's going. But he can't go forward. Timothy's next. Part of Paul's succession plan is to ensure that Timothy knows that he's got to go himself. And ladies and gentlemen, I pray that as we are having these conversations with our loved ones, that we can do something in the same line that Paul shows us here. This is not really a concern of mine that that my children and my nieces and nephews and, and all I don't I don't want them to have to go the way I came. That was mine. I and I know my parents because they said the same thing to me. They don't want us, my siblings, to have to go the same way they came. Because that was for them. Right? So we anticipate that we're leaving but we just don't jump off and and cut everything off. We at least transition them over to say it might look similar to where we've been before. But now this is yours. You have got to make of it what you are going to make of it. How do you know this? In the text, Paul says, listen, I charge you. I solemnly urge you. I am consecrating you in the sight of God and of Christ Jesus. This is yours. This, this has been laid on you. It's your name on the line of my will and testimony. I'm giving this to you. Okay. Now, he, he knows that he what Timothy has been called to do, and he knows um, what must be ongoing for him. And what must be ongoing for Timothy is the very thing he's been called to do. He's been called to preach the word. He's been called to keep preaching, whether it's in season or out of season. The, the NRSV says whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, you keep preaching. Your, your task then is to convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. Why? Because Paul knows something else. Paul is able to anticipate how people will react and respond to what Timothy has been called to do. How does Paul know this? Because people reacted and they responded to what Paul was called to do. Paul is concerned about the ongoing mission and ministry of the gospel. He is bequeathing, if you will, this great treasure to his disciple, mentee, uh, to his apprentice in ministry, Timothy, and saying to him, our shared ministry will go forward. I can't take it further. It's yours. And this is how you get there. So maybe instead of just giving our uh, offspring and gener future generations the stuff and letting them do with it whatever they will without any insight or wisdom and instruction maybe we ought to sit down with them ahead of time and say listen child listen grandchild listen whoever listen organization listen church this is how i came into the stuff i'm giving you these are some of the things we were able to do because of this stuff and my suggestion is that you look at it in that way. Now, it's still their path to travel. 
Timothy still has to be the one to preach. He still has to be the one to be patient and be uh, convincing and encouraged. He's, he's got to do it, but Paul's he's got something to add because he's been there before. So maybe as we make out our end of life, our documents and what have you, it's helpful to have these conversations with our loved ones so that they know what it took to get where we are and then they may be able to better appreciate that part of succession means that we set them up to be successful. He anticipates how people will respond, how they're going to react to, Tim to Timothy. But Paul also now welcomes how he finds himself in the present moment. Okay. Okay. Paul, he, Paul is, is instructing uh, the Christian here who is living this life to live again. Because he knows in verse 6, he says, listen, as for me, I don't have much left. My time is winding up. He, he realizes this. He says, I'm already being poured out as a libation, as a drink offering. This is significant because he recognizes he does not have long left. I'm being poured out. I've, this, I've done what I can do. But I don't want you to see this as Paul uh, feeling discouraged. This is not Paul uh, in a moment of sorrow here. No, no. This is Paul coming to grips with the fact like you and I, we don't have to disguise the fact that we, we may not be ready to go, right? As we fill out our documents and we get our affairs in order, we, we, we can do this and not be ready. Like, I want to live a few more years. I, I, I give me, Lord, give me some more time. <laughs> Amen. Give me some more time. But I recognize that this time is coming up and whenever it comes up, it comes up. So with that recognition, I can continue in this moment, according to Paul, because he's able to locate where he is in the present moment. And where is Paul in the present moment? He has been faithful. And this is why I say that we ought to not receive this moment of life with discouragement or as a moment of sorrow only, but we should receive it as perhaps potential for celebration because we've carried out what God has given us to do. He finds himself in this moment. And what does he say about it? He says, you know, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race I have kept the faith. Do you know, I hope you see what Paul does not say about himself here. Because you and I know the truth. I'm, I know Paul knows the truth. This Paul has not always been this Paul. Oh no, he, he, he's been Saul. He's been the persecutor of the church. He's been the one, he was the one consenting to Stephen's death, holding coats. He was the one um, who was a bounty hunter, if you will, for Christians, right? This, that's this Paul. He was the one striking fear and terror into the lives of uh, Jewish uh, converts to Christianity. That, that was him. But this is him too. Now, at the end of his time, which one does he locate? He locates the one that has fought a good fight, that has finished the race, that has kept the faith. And maybe this suggests to us that as we go about our task of planning for the end of our lives, that we know we've made some mistakes and missteps along the way. We know we've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know we have not always gotten it right. But at the end, 
what will be the final word pronounced over your life? Not by somebody else, because the preacher's going to get up there and, and say some flowery words, whether you deserve them or not. <laughs> right? There'll be some friends who are going to take, they're going to be asked to speak for two minutes, and they're going to take 10. Okay? Other people are going to say wonderful, but now as you prepare yourself for the end, what do you say about yourself? And so if we talk about anticipating, welcoming, and celebrating these transitions, part of this is like, like David, we should learn, sometimes we have to encourage ourselves. You know, you live to be 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, and up. You Listen, you've done something good. Something right has been going on. Let, let's talk about that. Let that be the joy that is the fuel for your planning. That's what Paul, that's what Paul does. He locates himself here. He doesn't let somebody else write his story for him. He writes it for himself. I've fought a good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. And here's where celebration comes in. So he's anticipating the end. He welcomes the end. And can you see this celebration? Verse eight, from now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord has, the righteous judge will give me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This sounds like cause for celebration. This is how we can meet the end of our days, leaning in to the idea that we can smile our way home. We can rejoice our way home. We can dance our way home. We can shout our way home because the righteous judge has something to say about how we get there. This is the same judge that Paul calls to bear witness to the uh, succession plan un unfolding in verse one. Same judge who's judging the living and the dead. This judge is also the righteous judge who has prepared for Paul a crown of righteousness. He receives this from the judge. This goes along with the way that he views himself. And again, I want to encourage you in the same way, Christian friend, my brother, my sister, you who have been received by Christ, you who have received Christ unto yourself will eventually come to the day where you get to meet him. And I don't know about you, but that's cause for celebration. We get to meet Jesus. We get to meet Jesus. That's the succession. That's the beauty and the glory of all that you and I have been working toward for all this time. One day, this righteous judge is going to call our name. And no matter what else happens in the process, he, he's prepared, Paul says, a crown of righteousness. This, this, is, this is great. I, 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 get, I get excited thinking about it uh, because... Ultimately, all the planning, all the fuss and the muss and all of this stuff that we go through, yeah, you know, it's important, but there's something else that's out there for me. I, I want that. Give me the crown of righteousness. I, I want to stack, I want to get to that day where I get to meet Jesus. But until then, until then, I told you before, I'm not in a hurry. <laughs> I'm not in a hurry. I want to I want to be around for a few more years. I, I'd love to see a few more things happen. Um, so uh, if the Lord stays at his hand and, and does not call my name for a few more years, I'm okay. Um, but until then, I got to get ready. And until then, you, my beloved, my brother, my sister, you, sir, you, ma'am, have got to get ready. This is what it looks like to prepare for the end of life. It's, the, it's our opportunity to prepare for the moment when God calls our name and we're not doing it just for ourselves, 
we prepare for those whom we love and we prepare for the church of Christ itself. All right, we're going to talk about some strategies in a moment, but let me hear from you. Any comments, questions, anything that you need me to kind of lift up and say more about out of this text or otherwise? I, I know I, I left some, some uh, breadcrumbs. I pray that you will have opportunity to follow the trail. Um, when you have an opportunity to do so uh, in this chapter. What I really want you to get out of this, though, is, is at that end there, like the social succession planning and the transition of our presence from this life does not have to meet despair or does not have to have us end up with overwhelming anxiety about the unknown and what's going to happen to our loved ones after we leave. No, get, get ready for that now. Prepare now. This is the example that Paul gives us in the text. All right. There are some strategies here. Speaking of that, strategies. All right. So this is also on your handout. Uh, to properly prepare for the end of life, it is important not to wait until the end. You can get your affairs in order now. Do not Amen. wait until the end. Get your affairs in order now, Paul's approach for this preparation provides the following strategies, I think, that can help us transition well. Here are some strategies. First, develop the context for your life's work. Develop the context for your life's work. This may take a little bit of unpacking for us to do. Um, because of, I think it would be helpful for us to identify what our purpose is, and then we can work to that end. So ensure that you are going down the road to which you have been called to travel. And if you are always aiming at your mission, at your purpose in life, you can begin to develop the context for your life's work. That's what Paul is doing when he calls, uh, uh, says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who's the judge, the living, uh, who is the judge, the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom. Paul is clear about the end for him. And then you see that come back later in the in the chapter, verse eight, when he, again he mentions this righteous judge. So if you develop the context of your life's work, that can help with your preparing for the eventuality of the end itself. Second one here is to disciple and encourage your successor. Again, if you remember last week, we lifted up this example, not to only be from one individual to another, but also we broadened it to include also a family unit. Um, and, you know, so it can be a corporate uh, uh, consideration. It could be church, could be ministry. This notion of succession uh, is intended to identify what happens after you are gone. So now, disciple somebody, train them, and encourage them prepare the ones who are going to follow you in the work. I pray that you have seen Paul doing this throughout 1st and 2nd Timothy, and then even again here in chapter 4 of 2nd Timothy. Disciple and encourage your successor. Third, reflect courageously. Reflect courageously. Remember, remember sometimes we've got to in order to get our succession plan right, we've got to take stock of where we've been, the road we've traveled to get here. Name these things, name these people, name these places, name these experiences and adventures, name the hardships, name the joys, right? Name the causes for celebration, name the moments of tears, name them. Reflect courageously. And then when you finish reflecting courageously, Maybe you can come out on the end like like Paul says here. Now nah, I'm ready. I'm ready now. I'm I'm already being poured out. I've done my work. I'm ready. Okay. 
So be gracious to yourself. Remember I said, when Paul begins to locate himself, he doesn't locate Saul, the persecutor. He locates Paul, the faithful. So be gracious to yourself and let your good work inform the present. Let your good work inform the present. Don't be guided by the murky past that God has rescued you from. Let the grace of God be your guide, even the grace of God that you show to yourself. Fourth strategy, reflect victoriously. Reflect victoriously. Again, there's a whole lot more that you know I could probably say about that eighth verse, but it, this is a sign of victory for Paul. The sign of victory. He knows there's a crown of righteousness, and in fact, he lifts up this idea of the crown um, of righteousness in First Corinthians as well. When he talks about there's, uh, he will receive the laurel or the wreath that is given to the winner of the Olympic or the Olympiad Games that are being played there in the region. And the Romans, uh, especially in that empire, would have been very familiar with the idea of sport. And those who came out victorious would have been crowned with a crown of laurels. He borrows the language there and says it's a crown of righteousness to match the one who gives him the crown. Who gives it to him? The righteous judge. So whereas the winners of the Roman games would have received a crown to identify them with the Roman emperor, Paul having come to his end, ready to receive his crown, he said, my crown is going to identify me with the righteous judge. That sounds like victory to me. He's at the end. He's going to receive this great crown. Mm -hmm. Those four strategies, again, maybe there's others that you can locate in this fourth chapter. Um, I only took us through the eighth verse. But I pray that this has been helpful, at least to have a, an understanding of what it might look like to dive into this notion of succession planning, to prepare yourself, prepare those who are coming after us for the eventuality of this time. And now, um, before we go, um, as I try to do, want to make sure we connect um, the thread that runs through the Bible in the way of succession planning and end of life planning, because I'm convinced that the Bible being the word of God does not leave us without a witness for every moment and instant of our lives. And this is one of those numbers chapter 27, verse 12 through 23. We've talked about Moses already a couple of times, but he's listed there again. Uh, Moses 27, 12 through 23, uh, but pay attention particularly to verse 22 and 23 uh, in that text. All right. Deuteronomy, again, the same idea. We talked about this last week, so you have that there in front of you. Ruth, that's an interesting one. Ruth chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, and then again chapter 4, verse 9 through 12. And you might say, well, I don't remember anybody dying in Ruth, but you do remember people preparing for the eventuality of life, do you not? In chapter three, Ruth says, hey, there's Boaz over there. <laughs> Naomi, go connect yourself. Naomi rather says to Ruth, hey, there's Boaz over there. Go get, get be in his field. Make sure he sees you. <laughs> and then this is what you do to take care of yourself. What is Naomi doing? Naomi's trying to get Ruth to prepare herself for the eventuality that is coming with Naomi's life. Now, of course, Ruth is going to be taken care of by Boaz, but Naomi is no longer going to be there to be somewhat a protector for Ruth, who is a stranger, a foreigner in that land. Right? But she's, she's preparing her. In the same way that you and I ought to be looking out for our loved ones. There's going to be a day when we are no longer here. We can't protect them, but we can. We sure can introduce them to people, set them up in the right places, or in the right ways, so that they can continue on. That's Ruth. Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 through 
30. Um, I lost my notes on that one. Matthew 26, verse 26 through 30 is where you find the institution of the Lord's Supper. Interesting that we would lift this up for succession planning. But what does this say to us? While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is the my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Here we go, verse 29. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Here's Jesus preparing his disciples for what's coming in the next couple of hours. Yes, the next few days and what's coming for eternity. He says, I, I, we're not going to do this again until we're doing it in my father's kingdom. Okay, Jesus is preparing his disciples for the eventuality of his death, but he's also preparing his disciples for the eventuality of their eternity. Which helps me to appreciate that succession planning does not always have to put us in the dumps and leave us there. There's there's resurrection after that. And there's eternity after that. And then, as I mentioned last week. And I think I said it again uh, today. First and second Timothy are essentially um, Paul's uh, will and testament, if you will, for Timothy. He's got Timothy's name all over this. He is he's really encouraging Timothy to be all that he can be because Paul is no longer able going to be able to share in the ministry and to fulfill his life's calling. But he knows that someone, namely Timothy, can carry on his life's calling. And ultimately, that's what it should be about spiritually. Now, ultimately, and from a practical standpoint, even as we're going through our plans, our succession plans, we're filling out our checklist. That's what it should be about. Not that the person uh, does what we would have done with the time that we had. But so that we can set them up and prepare to do what they can do with the time that they have. Amen.